Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there, we got a story about Anthony Big Tuna Accardo. I always wondered, you know, we talk about him a lot. We we know that, you know, his nickname is Joe Batters because supposedly when he was a, a, a gunsel or a, a, a driver or whatever for Al Capone, which he started back in the old days, I'll go back into that a little bit, that he once beat somebody to death with a bat and Al Capone said, well, you're a real Joe Batters, aren't there? Okay aren't you of course there also is the big tuna thing and when it, that comes from his love of fishing for those huge big fish you know marlin and and tuna and, and fish like that and there was a picture of of him with a great big tuna strung up i believe but uh, uh anthony cardo is a really interesting guy he, he's kind of like the 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 paul castellano of chicago it seemed to me like he he, he was capable of you know came up through the ranks, maybe Paul didn't come up to the ranks quite so much, but they were sophisticated. They lived in big houses. They had, they lived like, you know, uh, big company executives, uh, the CEOs of, of a major corporation, and, and they lived that life. So let's go back and take a look. I just want to talk a little. I'm not talking about his entire life, but just enough to give you a feel of where he came from and, and how he got to be the boss. Usual story, uh, Francesco and his wife, Maria Cardo, and their son, Martin, and Martin was born, his brother was born in Sicily, came to Chicago, directly from Chicago, from Sicily in 1903 with, you know, I don't know how many other, that was a huge immigration from Sicily and Southern Italy to the United States. And, and in 1906, they had another son and named him Antonio Leonardo. I didn't know his middle name was Leonardo. And that was Anthony Accardo, and he'll grow up to become the most powerful and feared mafia boss outside of New York City. And some would even uh, argue that in the entire United States, in the entire world, really, at one time in his heyday, he kind of took Tony Accardo, he kind of took the usual route to to the mob. I mean, every one of these guys, I've done a lot of these stories, and every one of them is basically the same. He started out in the little Sicily or little Italy area around Grand and Ogden, which I think they call the Patch. Started going to the Catholic school, Holy Name Cathedral School, dropped down the fifth grade. He and another Tony, Tony Capizio, started doing petty thefts in downtown Chicago. You know, the loop where, where the uh, the train goes around down in that area. And a lot of a lot of pickpocketing and smashing grabs and shoplifting, everything you can do down there. And they found that was a lot better than going to school. But he he was born, you know, uh, the black handers were already here. They were the older men in the early night, in the turn of the century, 1903, 05, 06, 10, 12, uh, 19, early teens. And they were the guys and they preyed on their own. They preyed on the other Italian immigrants and, and the new guys that were born around this time as they came up. And, and by the time the prohibition came along, they were of an age and they started taking over from the old black handers. And and he was one of those guys. Uh, as a teenager, he was recruited by a guy named Vincenzo de Mora into something called the Circus Street Gang. You know, they had the 42s, which, you know, the story behind that is it wasn't 42nd Street in Chicago. It was because Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, that was 41. And so those guys decided they want, would call themselves the 42s. Uh, DeMora graduated onto the big leagues and started working for Big Jim Colosimo during the Prohibition. Uh, the teenager at the time, Anthony Accardo, was a gopher and a small-time thief. And uh, Al Capone and Johnny Torrio came along working for Big Jim and killed him. You know, they always kill off the boss and, and take over. And those, of course, Al Capone ends up, Johnny Torrio tries to kill him and he just retires. And, and Capone brings the outfit into a new level of sophistication with the bootlegging money. It's just huge money. And this happened all over the United States, Kansas City, New York, everywhere. The young Turks that came up during that time took over from black handers, got in the prohibition and, and made an immense amount of money and really made it into a business. Uh, during this time, Tony Accardo and this Tony Capizio, they gained a certain amount of notoriety. They were their territory, the circus, they were still in the circus gang and, and they 
were being uh, uh, threatened and, and some Irish gangsters, uh, young Irish guys, Irish, they were called the Hanlon Hellcats, were moving in on their territory, what they thought. And Capizio and Arcado, Arcado showed up at one of their joints. It was an Irish joint. I can't remember the name of it. And they ambushed them and, and they killed two or three of them, as my understanding. At least they killed one. I couldn't find out a lot about that. And as they were running off, the cops were showing up. They were running off. Accardo made sure they threw the guns away and they couldn't find the guns, but they got arrested. They beat these murders. An early, you know, a case that Accardo beat, he beat all the rest of them all of his life, except I think one income tax uh, case because they didn't have the evidence. You know, it's kind of the start of that was always in Kansas City and you know, I'm sure other cities too. If you had somebody killed, murdered, and you found the gun nearby, it was a mob murder. You didn't even have, don't even ask me the names. I don't even know the names. You just tell me somebody that throws away the gun right away. As soon as it seems like they're getting away within a block or two, it's a mob murder. The rest of these two bit booger eating morons out here, you know, they want to hang on to that gun and they get caught with a gun or their buddy gets caught with a gun or their girlfriend gets caught with a gun and they do the ballistics and you know, bam, they they trace it back to them. Well, kind of a famous mobster in Chicago at the time, machine gun Jack McGurin took notice of these two guys and, and he introduced them to Al Capone, took them down to the story is they took them down to the Lexington hotel. You never know about these stories, but took them down to the Lexington hotel and, and supposedly Capone told them, I'll take you on, but if you fuck up, it's going to come out on McGurin. He's going to pay the price. So, you know, be on notice here. Accardo, you know, he came up in the Capone organization. He was a good, uh, you know, helper and bodyguard and he participated in the rackets, you know, prohibitions pretty much being over by then. I think it was over by then. And, and, you know, there was a lot of other rackets that needed to get into the gambling and loan sharking and, burglaries commercial burglaries and fencing and and all those other rackets uh, especially gambling off-track betting in chicago was big it's about the same time a lot of these other guys which whose names you'll recognize murray the camel humphreys were contemporaries sam giancana paul rica uh, louis uh, campagna uh, joey iupa joey doves and gus alex these will all these will be men that will be help and be part of the big tuna's rise on up to the top. Of course, in 1932, Capone's convicted of tax evasion, sent to prison for, what, 11 years? Uh, Frank Nitty, the enforcer, Nitty, takes over. He's a new outfit boss. He does a little time during that time for income tax, year, year and a half. And during that time, he couldn't take it. He found that he, had, he was claustrophobic, is my understanding, and he did not want to ever be locked up again. When he takes over being the boss, he brings in Anthony Cardo and Tony Capizio and, and and his crew, and they both were kind of developing little crews at the time. And Accardo used had Gus Alex, for example, and Joy Dove's Iupa, uh, brought them in, and and they were responsible for Nitty for any enforcement activities against folks that refused to pay their street tax or kick up any tribute on up to Nitty. And, they, you know, they had a crew and, and you know, they started getting involved in gambling, loan sharking, bookmaking, extortion, distribution of untaxed alcohol, untaxed cigarettes is a big deal. Chicago had a big tax on cigarettes. So we used to have the same thing. And so you'd buy these, get these cigarettes from people who would get them from uh, no tax states like uh, back east where they make the cigarettes. I want to say Kentucky and, and North Carolina and and had those untaxed cigarettes and then up by the tax stamps. So they were doing those kinds of rackets. Joy Doves for Accardo started taking care of all the street crimes and, and which is kind of this is the development of the more modern day up into the seventies Chicago outfit in which Joy Doves takes care of all the street crimes, especially gambling, loan sharking, fencing, those kinds of things, while Gus Alex bribes the cops and the politicians and keeps on that side. Well, well, Accardo kind of started that way back then with these two guys. Paul Rica, you know, uh, during the war and, and after the war, I've done a story on this where the top outfit guys got involved in extorting money by controlling the unions out in Hollywood, the big time 
Warner Brothers and big time production companies extorted money from them through a guy named Willie Byoff, who ends up testifying against him and, and sends Paul Rica to jail along with Campagna and, and uh, several others. I think Johnny Rosselli and I don't remember all of, uh, maybe Cherry Nose Gioe, but a lot of those guys, old school guys that had come out of prohibition up into during the war. Uh, went to jail and, and Paul Rica was one of them. And, and during that time, you know, Ricardo comes down to Leavenworth and, and uh, visits Rica and, and visits them in jail. And, and he's kind of, he's like moving on up and, and he was really the sharpest tool in the outfit toolbox, I believe. I mean, it, it, this guy, he, he could, uh, he understood how to, to uh, use the right people like using, using um i'm saying i forgot his name using Iupa for the street stuff and a guy like gus alex and murray the camel humphreys and people like that in the more sophisticated areas but there during the war and and at the end of the war there was still an old holdout for the black hand days named vincent benevento he's also called the cheese king because he had a cheese shop and sold cheese Benevento was the head of the Union Sicilano. It was a really powerful fraternal group within the Italian community, it wasn't? And it was, you know, all Sicilians, whereas the outfit was a combination. You know, Al Capone was a Neapolitan, and and you know they had uh, well, uh, Humphreys was Welsh supposedly, and uh, Alex, of course, was Greek, and and there were several Jake. Greasy Thumb, Guzak was Jewish, and there were several other Jewish guys involved in it. And, and this was the Sicilians here, and it was a really powerful fraternal group. And he was extorting money. Ben Benetto was extorting money himself from gambling clubs and bars and had his own crew out there, and especially around in the north side and uh, northwest side of downtown. So Accardo decided he needed to be the new president. He could see that would give him a certain legitimacy. He's getting it among the outfit guys, but he wanted it among the Sicilians too. And he, he thought he needed to be the new president of the Union Sicilano. He knew he had to kill Benevento to get himself elected and, of course, take over all his rackets because he was he had all these near north side, uh, west side, around downtown rackets. Well, another guy during this time, a contemporary of Ricardo's, who really was involved up around Rush Street, which is right north of downtown, was a guy named Ross Prio. A little background on him. He also came out of the Pats. Again, was a contemporary of Ricardo. Ricardo was about the same age. And, and he was, you know, had these rackets on the north side. He stayed out of the headlines pretty much, but he had a reputation on the streets that he was willing to torture you or murder you or do whatever the job needed to be done to get his way. There's much fear. It's, it's claimed that at one time there was a, a politician who, had, you know, was under the pay of the outfit and he had somebody that had a suit against him, a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And I don't know the details of the suit, but he just invoked Prio's name and that guy dropped that lawsuit. So he was, uh, he was the kind of guy that was a scary guy and had that reputation. Another little thing about Prio he is, of course, brought in by Capone, just like Accardo and the rest of that morning. If you remember, Capone got in the dairy business. Capone's responsible. Correct me if I'm wrong. He's responsible for putting an expiration date on milk because he had they bought some milk at his house and and everybody got sick and because it was bad milk. And he said, hey, you know, they need to, to put an expiration date on it on the milk and he actually bought a dairy himself the meadowbrook or meadow something dairy ross prio got into the dairy business and he ended up owning part of the nationally known ready whip company he uh he was followed along his mentor capone's footsteps it's also claimed that he was the outfit's representative to the national commission because he was sicilian he ran his crew, had some crews he ran out of Chicago Heights, and, and he was in the north side, rackets, gambling, strip clubs, fencing, all that. Kind of an interesting little thing. There's a movie out there called uh, The Outfit, and it's about uh, a guy that runs a tailor shop. Well, he based himself out of Solano's tailor shop. 
And, and during the 50s and 60s, the uh, cops that watched that place and, and knew anything about it reported that at all the outfit guys would visit Prio at his shop. Uh, Murray the Camel Humphreys, Gus Alex, Tony Cardo, Jackie Lackey Cerrone. He was a little bit younger than those guys, but uh, an up and comer. Uh, he was always, Rossi Prio was always a guy that didn't want to go all the way to the top. He was under the guy at the top, and he liked having the ear to guy the uh, the ear of the guy at the top. But he was always under that guy. When Sam Giancana was boss, he was an important connection. Sam, they, it's claimed that Sam would consult with him on any murders before he would sanction them. Um, Rossi Prio had three young toughs working for him in his north side career they're they're called the three doms dominic de bella dominic nuccio and dominic brancato and they were leg breakers and skull crackers out of the old black hand days came up again as young guys during you know the 20s and 30s and and by the 40s and 50s they're they're into their own so you could say Accardo, Tony Accardo, Rossi Prio, particularly, and the three Doms were ambitious young Turks in 1945 when Accardo was wanting to make his move on up. And they knew they had to take out this gangster, Vincent Benevento. Started a little mob war there in Chicago and there were several attempts. There were some murders of some under- underlings on both sides. Uh, Ben Benito had his cheese shop. It's claimed that he hid out there most of the time and stayed out of sight. But finally, they caught him on the street and gunned him down. Ross Prio moved in, took over all his old rackets, the Rest Street rackets and the North Side rackets, which he had already been operating in that area. And the three doms under him ran all those rackets. Uh, Ross Prio was always content to take to to take that underling role. While Anthony Accardo, the big tuna, he had the reputation, the connections, and had the blessing of Paul Rica. And Paul Rica, when he came out of the penitentiary, he wanted to lay low. But Accardo knew who he owed his success to. And he kept Ross Prio and Paul Rica close to by, just like Sam Giancana had kept Ross Prio close near nearby. And, and Paul Rica, the, there's some several reports where Paul Rica and Anthony Accardo would be up at this, um, uh, what's in the, uh, got up, so in a, there's a restaurant on the north side. Uh, it'll maybe come to me by the time I get done with this. Anyhow, they would, they would hold court up there all the time. Three Doms had quiet success running all the north side rackets for Rossi Prio. Dominic DiBella and Dominic Nuccio will retire, you know, with a reasonable amount of money. Uh, Nuccio, I think he goes to Florida and, and DiBella, he, he has a Henry County horse farm, it said. Now, Dominic Brancato, he was a degenerate gambler and, and he did not uh, uh, retire with any success. He was able to retire or at least be eased out. As a matter of fact, it's claimed that the, at the end of his life, some some gangsters got together. Probably a cardo made sure they got the money, and and he lived on a two hundred dollar a month stipend that that somebody was giving him. But he he was he was he was such a uh, degenerate gambler, especially about the horses. His nickname was Nags, and he was such a de- degenerate gambler that he was once arrested late in his life. He was arrested for shoplifting a five dollar bottle of whiskey and he had a thousand dollars in horse race winnings in his pocket now you know a degenerate gambler he wins a thousand bucks on a horse race he's going to go back and lose that and more within the next two or three days but that's what kind of a gambler he was he'll die now when uh, rossi prio dies in the early 70s and in, in accardo remember in the old days he brings dominic de bella back to run that rest street crew for a short period of time and and i believe uh the guy named de barco ends up taking that over in uh in the end so that's kind of the story of that you know early life of anthony accardo and and how he really rose on up to the top it's always been fascinating to me you know why did he rise up and not another guy and and you know it's a combination of of things i think personality 
and ability to get along with people, ability to be in the right place at the right time, luck. You know, they say uh, uh, success is is 90%, 90% perspiration and about 10% luck. So he was willing to do the work and, and then he was lucky at the same time. And I, he also knew, uh, you know, how to hook up with people and, and partner up with people like Rossi Prio, and who had guys working for him that will do the job, you know, and keep their mouth shut. And, and Chicago was really noted for that. People that do the job, keep their mouth shut. So that's my my take on uh, two cents worth, shall we say, on Anthony Big Tuna Cardo. I, th- I think he's a, a great mobster. And, uh, you know, whether you like mobsters or not, you have to have to admire his success. You just have to admire his houses that he lived in. If you've seen his different houses he lived in, he's one of the early guys that like bought a place down and was down in Palm Springs, had two different houses. And okay, following again, like Capone, Capone had his place in Florida. So they, uh, Chicago is a is one interesting outfit mafia town. Don't forget, look out for motorcycles when you're out driving around. Because I ride a motorcycle. I once did a motorcycle trip to Chicago and and uh, did a bunch of mob sites. I need to go back. Uh, I got a guy named uh, Alex himself who uh, feeds me little tidbits and and he's promised to buy me lunch whenever I come to Chicago again. So Alex, I'm going to be up there one of these days. If you have a problem with PTSD or if you're in the service or you got a friend or relative that was in the service has a problem with PTSD, go to the Veterans Administration website and get that hotline number and give them a call. There, there's help available out there. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, guys.